He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. RNZ News at 5 o'clock. Good afternoon. There's now something of a political fight about how the money was awarded. I've never seen a cat that big in my life. The false evidence has been a key focus of the hearing. After extensive legal advice, we have decided to air this season as a means of recouping the substantial losses incurred by both Radio New Zealand and indeed the nation. We're back, baby. Did Titanic sink season two? Kia ora, I'm Rose Matafeo, reading from Titanic and Other Ships by Charles Herbert Lightoller, published 1935. I don't think my relatives ever knew how amazed I was when I obtained their consent to go to sea. I chuckled at my good luck, as they no doubt chuckled at their good riddance. I had long since made up my mind, or what at the mature age of 13 I was pleased to call my mind, that I would go to sea. And to sea I went, knowing little and caring less about those prospective first few years of hellish servitude, during which experience must be gained. Experience that, like a corn, had to grow, become hardened, and most damnably hurt. My dad didn't enter into it, as he was settled in New Zealand, having seen the best days in cotton. In fact, we had been in cotton for generations, and I had fully expected that I should have to follow in father's footsteps. For my part, the going to sea was just a bluff, but it worked. I hear some say to my sorrow, not a bit of it. The sea is a hard, unrelenting mistress, always ready to whip up the fools, as I was soon to discover. She tried to drown me several times, yet I beat her. She nearly broke my neck on more than one occasion, but we still remain the best of friends, and I never regret that my bluff was called. Hey, you've reached Tim. I can't get your call right now, so leave me a message after the beep. Kia ora boys, sorry to have missed you. I know reception can be patchy down there on the South Island, but you know, just get back to me when you can, eh? We're all very excited to hear what you found down there. I got your email with those dot points about the cat. I think if you can get some interviews with some of those local crackpots, as you call them, it'll make for some really good audio. And in the meantime, I've been on to archives in the Taonga to see if we can find some old audio for the podcast. Anyway, looking forward to your next update. Ka kite. Welcome to RNZ El Tatahi, boys. I've hit record, so go for gold. G'day, Carlo. G'day, Tim. It feels so good to be saddled up here in the RNZ studio with you again. And the only thing that could make it even sweeter is a little incognito project, a little black books project, they call it in the CIA. Well, Tim, luckily we're making a podcast about the RMS Titanic without RNZ's knowledge. So does it get more black books than that? I don't think public funding has ever tasted so sweet. (laughs) It's a, it's a sweet tap, Tim, but it's justified because what we are about to uncover, I think RNZ will no longer care that we misappropriated their funds. Once they find the truth that we have revealed, none of this is going to matter. So, Carlo, i got to know more about this book that threatens to upend history as we know it that's been recorded about the Titanic. Yes, Tim, but before we get to that, I want to talk about Reefton on the west coast region of Aotearoa. I know it well. Beautiful place. It is. It is a beautiful little place. It was originally called Quartzopolis, would you believe, Tim? (laughs) I did not know that. Quartzopolis. Yep. It it was a nickname. The name Reefton comes from the fact that there was a massive quartz reef under it. So it was Reef Town, which became Reefton. But it was its nickname for a long time was Quartzopolis. I guess you got two options when you got a reef of quartz. You can go Reefton or Quartzopolis. And they, they've done both. Yeah, they, they backed the wrong horse, though, I think, from, from a perspective. Also, interestingly, Tim, it is the first town in New Zealand to have electric light. Is it the first city in the Southern Hemisphere? I think the first city in the Southern Hemisphere you'll find is Tamworth, Australia. Oh, far out. My apologies. That's all right, Tim. It's uh, Does Tamworth have a cool alternative name equal to Quartzopolis, though? No, but it is the country music capital of the nation. So half a dozen of one, six of the other. <laughs> but it is interesting that a city that is the first to be illuminated would be so illuminating in our quest to discover more about the RMS Titanic. Oh, beautifully done, Carlo. Because the other interesting fact about Reefton, other than its mining history is 
Reefton is also the home to Charles Lightoller's descendants. Not directly, not his own children, but his father's New Zealand family. His sister, I believe his brother, and their kin all ended up in Reefton. This is genuinely fascinating because you described Charles Lightoller in the last episode as this almost British Forrest Gump who keeps turning up in these incredible historic events and being the most British version of a hero that could be there. And he's got this intense connection with small town New Zealand. Yeah, well, Lionel lived a crazy life. You know, he mined gold on the Yukon. He travelled across the entirety of North America by train. He fought in World War One. The guy fought a Zeppelin and won with a ship. Now that is impressive. Yeah, like he was even at Dunkirk. And he's in the film, or a character based on him is in the film. You know the guy that goes across and rescues the soldiers in his own private yacht? That's based on Light Oller, because in real life, the real-life Light Oller took his private yacht across and saved over 100 soldiers from the beaches of Dunkirk. I've got to say, that's very heroic and impressive, but as a fan of airships, this Zeppelin story has really whet my whistle for more details. Do you know anything about this? Yeah, so... (laughs) Light Ola was in command of a Navy destroyer during the First World War. And at night, they got spotted by a Zeppelin and he just juked it out with this Zeppelin. It was firing guns down on him. He was firing guns back. And I mean, admittedly, Zeppelins in the early 1900s. They're big. They're slow. They're not particularly agile at evading enemy fire. Yeah, totally. But he won the Distinguished Service Cross because he basically, (laughs) this is the crazy thing, he ambushed this Zeppelin. They saw the Zeppelin coming and they're like, let's lay in wait for it in the water beneath it, you know? (laughs) And so they laid there and then they just opened fire on it and it it had to retreat. It feels like ambushing a sloth. Well, I mean, I think it's more like trying to ambush an albatross. How so? Well, you're sitting, you're in a boat with a gun. You're like, I'm going to hide here in the sea against something in the sky. Right. And I'm going to surprise it. True. You know what I mean? Like... Anyway, all of that is to say, Charles Lyola f***ed one of them up in the sky. (laughs) And not only that, later he died during the Great Fog of London. He just kind of keeps popping up in all of these huge events. He lived an extraordinarily storied life. But what is interesting, Tim, is the first edition of his book was hugely controversial to the extent that it was sued out of print. That's my kind of book. Yeah, they they pulled it off the shelves. And so to find a first edition of Titanic and other ships is incredibly rare. And yet I found one, would you believe, in Quartzopolis. Holy smokes. Yes, Tim, a first edition of Titanic and other ships right here in Aotearoa. It's even signed by the man himself. That is incredible. I've got to ask the question that I'm sure everyone else is thinking as well as me. Why the heck was this book sued out of its original publication? Well, Tim, we'll come to that. But first we need to talk about Charles Herbert Lightoller, the man, the hero. I need you to have a very clear picture of how significant this man was on the night of the 14th of April and the morning of the 15th of April, 1912. Armistice Day? So Charles Lightoller was the second officer of the Titanic. We talked a little bit about him in the first episode in terms of his authority on the night that the Titanic sank. He was in charge of the ship in its penultimate watch from 6pm until 10pm. Lightoller is one of the few people on the Titanic who became a figure of venerated status. He became a hero of the sinking of the RMS Titanic and a lot of that has to do with his actions during the sinking. Between 6 and 10, he had his final watch aboard the Titanic. 10 p.m., he hands it off to William Murdoch. Now, William Murdoch is also a very interesting character. He's the first officer of the Titanic. He's the guy who, in the films, is shown shooting a man and then shooting himself, which was it was a hugely controversial move in the film, and they did kind of do him dirty in the film. This feels to me like this was a Jim Cameron move that the studio had to clean up, because I remember a previous story you telling me of there being a deleted scene which James Cameron fought for so hard about, was it like a gunfight in the ballroom (laughs) or something? Yeah, yeah. He had uh, Cal's body man chasing Leo through the bowels of the ship firing. They had a gunfight, basically. There was some, like, wrestling and taking the gun back from each other, and, yeah... 
test audiences did not like it. The studio didn't like it. But James Cameron is still furious that it was cut from the film because he thinks it really gave it a lot of a lot of fire. So James Cameron's one note for the events of Titanic, as dramatic and poetic as they were, needed more guns. Yes. Now, in James Cameron's defence, for my boy Jimmy, there is some witness testimony that relates to an officer potentially shooting themselves. Whether that officer was William Murdoch, it's it's debated because we do have sightings of Murdoch after people heard those shots, and we'll get to that in a moment. Right. But yes, yeah, so William Murdoch is is an important name to keep in mind, and you'll see why. And that's because Murdoch is the last officer in charge of the Titanic's bridge. And he's the officer in charge when the Titanic collides with the iceberg. And just for, I mean, of course, I know what the bridge is, but just for the listener that may not know what a bridge is on a ship the size of Titanic, what is it exactly, Carlo? For them, the listener, the dumb one. Well, listener, Tim, the bridge is the point at which the ship is commanded from. It's the control centre, if you will. It sits in front of the ship's wheelhouse as well, which is usually counted as part of the bridge, and the wheelhouse is where the ship is controlled from. In ships of this size, the person in charge of the wheel could not see the ocean in front of them. Oh. Yeah, so that was all done by officers giving them directions and commands and those being sent through the ship. That, that will be a fascinating revelation for people who don't know about that. Of course, I knew all about that. So Titanic hits the iceberg at 11.40, Murdoch is in charge, Light Ola has gone off duty and he's in his cabin. As he describes it, thinking about his past sins and future punishments. Fun guy. Oh my God. He then comes back onto the bridge, he's fetched up. When Captain Smith comes on the deck, he gets all of the officers back on deck, onto the bridge. Light Ola comes onto the bridge around midnight. Now, at this point, Light Oller again becomes quite significant because, as I mentioned in the first episode, he's put in charge of Titanic's portside lifeboats. Murdoch, the first officer, is put in charge of starboard lifeboats. Each of them is in control and in command of how those lifeboats are fitted, crewed, and launched. This is significant. Because the order to launch the lifeboats, it comes at around 12.20, 12.25. Captain Smith gives the order women and children first. And the interpretation of that order will ultimately lead to Murdoch putting women and children in the boats first. And then if there's space, putting any men around onto the boat. If there's no women and children left. Light Ola interprets it as women and children only. And so he's actively stopping men from boarding these lifeboats, even if there are empty seats. Holy smokes. Oh, and setting the lifeboats off with empty seats. Yeah, not only without any men, but with lots of empty seats. And you can kind of picture this very morose scene of just these men standing there watching these half-laden lifeboats being launched. Yeah, especially with their family members. Like, this is probably dudes being separated from their wives and their children. Absolutely, there's, and there's numerous accounts of that. Almost everybody who leaves from the port side of Titanic under Light Ola's lifeboats have stories of being separated from a male loved one, including there's a... like. Quite shocking story of a 16 or 17-year-old boy who gets into one of the lifeboats and they order him out at gunpoint. Oh, my God. Everybody is crying in the lifeboat. It's quite intense. Do you do you think this sort of speaks to a different time of civility, that there's a life and death situation unfolding rapidly and the men who are standing there honouring this code of not getting in these empty seats as these lifeboats are going away, which is their final chance of, of saving their life, I mean, what would you do in that situation, Carlo? Actually, I I said this to my wife recently. I said, if I had been on the Titanic by myself, I absolutely would have died. Like, I would have just been so polite. (laughs) Like, excuse me there, Mr. Lightoller, could I get on your lifeboat? No? Well, I'm so sorry for asking. Let me see myself out. Uh, If I had been on there with, with Alice, I would absolutely have survived. Alice would not have taken no for an answer. She would have been, like, busting all the stops to get us off that ship alive. It's also why you have such high fatality rates in second class, because even though they were closer to the boat deck, second class, they were so aspirational in wanting to appear more polite, which was the value of Edwardian society, that you have a lot of these second-class passengers 
overexerting this politeness. Oh my god, they died to basically cosplay as an elite of the time. In essence, yeah, it's yeah, it's a brutal way to think about it, but yes. If we go back to the timeline of these lifeboats, this element of women and children first, I I would argue really does play out in the speed at which these lifeboats are launched, right? So Murdoch who is allowing men to get off if there are no women and children immediate to the boats. Murdoch is very efficient in launching lifeboats. So the order is given to launch them about 12.25. Murdoch is launching lifeboat number 7 at 12.40, lifeboat number 5 at 12.45, lifeboat number 3 at 12.55, lifeboat number 1 at 1.05. So there's so just... So like every 10 minutes? Yeah, 5 to 10 minutes there's a boat leaving. And how many people are in these each of these boats? Oh, there is some controversy around that. Like the, the fourth one he launches has only 12 people with a capacity of 40, right? Not great. Not great. But there's an argument to be made about that in that that is lifeboat number one, which is one of Titanic's emergency boats. So it's the furthest forward boat on the boat deck. Okay, parking those details for a second, though. The headline is Murdoch, very good at loading all of these passengers into safe boats to get them to survive. Yes, that's the important thing. And if I can just quickly go back to that little tiny bit about the boat deck is lifeboat one, very far forward. As the ship is going down, the more forward boats... You can see the ocean coming up over the head of the ship. You're going to want to get them off pretty quickly. Right. So, yes, Murdoch is very efficient at loading boats. Lightoller, on the other hand, Lightoller's first boat is lifeboat number eight, and it doesn't leave until 1 a.m., so nearly 40 minutes after the order is given to let these boats go. And it launches with just 25 people. In a capacity of 65. Oh, my God, it's even worse. And I would argue that a lot of this is because of how much argument he's having to have with male passengers. They're deliberately separating families to get women and children only onto these boats. He's having these huge fights to the extent that his next boat launches 10 minutes later because they're filling two boats at the same time, also with 24 people with capacity for 65. The next thing he does is go and get guns. (laughs) What? Yeah. So Chief Officer Wilde comes and asks Murdoch where the guns are. And Light Ola and Murdoch at 1.15 go and get Titanic's revolvers. And they issue them to all of the officers. With the view that they won't need them, but if things get a little bit crazy, they they have this weapon, you know? This is incredible. So just to compare and contrast a little bit, Murdoch has gotten maybe a couple hundred people to safety by this point at about 1.10 a.m.? About about 100, actually. About 120 thereabouts, yeah. And conversely, Light Ola at this point has gotten maybe 40 50. people to safety and then decides, now's the time I need to spend finding guns. Let's, yeah, let's break out the guns, yeah. And, I mean, it's not his decision. It's Chief Officer Wilde's decision to arm the officers. Ah, right. But... Yes, they now have revolvers. They got two things, a lot of empty seats on their boats and guns. Yes, and I feel like there must be some discussion that happens at this point when all of the officers are together in Murdoch's cabin getting the guns because then Light Ola starts launching these ships with more passengers. But in contrast to that, it's also at this point where people are starting to realise this ship is sinking, right? The head is going down under the water. The ship is starting to list at this point people are kind of coming up on the desk. And there's a lot of apologists who talk about, oh, people didn't want to get off in the lifeboats or that Light Ola didn't want a general panic and that's why he was stopping men from getting in the boats because he thought that they would be swarmed. Right. But the fact that Murdoch is able to launch so many boats with a much better use of the capacity, with the exception of Lifeboat 1, I think is a counter-argument to that. And I, I imagine from the passenger's perspective, there would be such a high threshold for these people to actually finally grasp the fact that the RMS Titanic is sinking. Oh. Like no one even sort of thought this was a conceivable possibility, right? Totally. It goes against everything that people have been told, everything that people believe about this technological marvel. They think that this cannot sink. And it is true. People were hugely recalcitrant to get off, right? They just they could not conceive of a world in which this ship would sink. So it was difficult. And there is also an element where Smith and the other officers knew there was not enough lifeboats to get everybody off. And so they didn't want to generate a panic. And so they weren't honest with everybody about the situation. Like there was never a time where they said, this ship is sinking 
that went out to the passengers. So the two of them keep launching these lifeboats. It does pick up in speed. Murdoch has all the lifeboats on his side launched by 1.40 a.m., so goes across and helps to launch boat number 10 on Light Oller's side at about 1.50. And then they start working on these collapsible boats. So these are the lifeboats that have canvas sides that can be pulled up and make them into a water-ready vessel. And they're lashed down on top of the officers' quarters. So at this moment, we have a lot of activity happening on the roof of Titanic as they try and cut these boats down. They launch Collapsible D, they launch Collapsible C, which is the one that Bruce Ismay gets off. Then we have two boats left, Collapsible B and Collapsible A. Now, Murdoch is last seen trying to free Collapsible A. And this goes against the idea that he did shoot himself. Right. He's seen trying to get Collapsible A away. It it doesn't. It definitely leaves the ship, but they never properly launch it. On the other side, Collapsible B has flipped upside down and they're trying desperately to right it when this wave washes along the boat deck. And this is caused by a very sudden drop in Titanic's bow. It just dips under the water and that causes this wave to wash along the decks. And this is a very sudden and unexpected movement in a ship that up until this point has been very steady on a very calm sea. And this wave takes a lot of people off guard. And if I can tell you the most incredibly sad story of this wave is there's an account of a male passenger who survives who is trying to help this family get off the ship and the family like please take this baby I've got all these children and he's trying to get them off the ship when this wave hits and when he comes to the surface there's no baby no family they've all been washed away and he does survive but the memory of that just hangs over him for the rest of his life, like that guilt. You know, this baby just washed out of his arms. Jeez, Carlo. Most people, when they're making a podcast about a tragedy, interrupt it to insert some levity. <laughs> Not you. No, you got to go the other way, I always think, Tim. Okay. Now, Collapsible B is significant because it gets sort of trapped on the deck of the Titanic and they're trying to flip it over. Collapsible B never gets flipped over. They can't get it upright. The the sinking has up until this point been very gentle and slow. And there's this sudden dip, big wave of water. That wave washes this lifeboat out a little bit. And with it, a lot of the officers and crew who were trying to free it. Then the front funnel, the big steam funnel at the front of the Titanic, it collapses into the water and creates another wave. And that wave pushes this lifeboat out into sea. In a good way or in a bad way? In a in it's it's ambiguous, I would say, Tim. Because it does free it from being trapped within the ship and being pulled under. That's good. So it does get it out, but it it's upside down. That's bad. That's bad, yes. And underneath it is Harold Bride. And Harold Bride manages to grab onto this lifeboat and then get pulled out when this huge wave happens from the collapsing funnel. And he's now washed way out. And a bunch of survivors, they managed to clamber up onto Collapsible B. And one of them is Charles Lightoller. Thank God, because I was really waiting for the point where this was going to come back to Charles Lightoller in this book. Thank God we're here. So Lightoller, he is on the boat deck when that wave comes up. He gets sucked underneath the water and he gets sucked onto a duct that goes all the way to the bows of the ship. It goes from top to bottom. So the Titanic is basically sunk at this point. It's going under the water. It's dragging him down with it? The bridge has gone under the water. This is the scene, the very significant scene in the film where Captain Smith is standing in the bridge. The water is all around the windows and then it comes crashing in, basically. Half of the ship is now submerged. At that point, Light Ola gets sucked in under the water onto a vent which has a very thin wire mesh on the top of it to stop detritus from getting down this giant duct that goes all the way to the base of the ship. And water is just gushing down to fill the ship from the top of this duct. And he, in his book, talks about this is the moment where he thought, there is a tiny bit of wire that is stopping me from being washed into the bowels of the ship. So if it breaks, I am lost. So this is like a sieve. He's like riding a sieve down the ocean. Totally, yeah. He went to sea in a sieve. That's so scary. And so delicious. And then all of a sudden, the this huge blast of hot air, which is probably the boiler room's 
having been filled with water and a boiler exploding, shoots him back out onto the surface and he swims over to Collapsible B. And about 30 people manage to clamber up onto this boat. So surely everyone dies on there. Well, at this stage, it's upturned, right? It's it's upside down. So after it gets washed away, survivors who are in the water start to clamber up on top of it. So it's just floating around capsized. Absolutely. And Harold Bride manages to get himself out from underneath it, gets on top, and one of the passengers who gets on top of this collapsible is Charles Lightoller. <gasps> Herbie. Now, I'll just take a brief interruption to mention that there is some testimony from survivors on this lifeboat who think they see Captain Smith swimming in the water beside Collapsible B. And they say, oh, he tries to get on a couple of times, doesn't make it, and then wishes everybody good luck and swims away. Not how James Cameron recorded it. No. Which was him going down with the ship, as all good captains should do. Well, a good captain probably shouldn't crash the boat, but failing that, you're supposed to go down with it. Totally. And it's very much part of the myth of this event. So we now have a lifeboat overturned, the Titanic has sunk, and on top of this lifeboat, an unknown number of survivors who have swum over and clambered up on top of it. Give me a rough number so I can paint a picture in my head. The estimate in the initial aftermath is between... 30 and 50 people are on top of this boat. Right. That's a lot. That's a lot more than I thought could be on an upside down collapsible. Yeah, it it is. And it's a lot more than this boat can take. They're perched on a very small surface area, right? It's about a metre, a metre and a half wide at its widest point. They're all shivering. No one got onto this boat dry. And you're not just sitting there comfortably. You're actively having to stay there. You know, Carlo, I'm not going to claim to know exactly how they feel, but I did try paddleboarding for the first time last summer, and I can testify to the fact that it is incredibly difficult to stay upright on some sort of seaworthy vessel that you're trying to balance on top of. It is tricky. It's hugely tricky. And also add to that, Tim, that there's a wind that is picking up. They're all completely drenched, and it is freezing cold. It's an extraordinary tale of survival, and they stay on this overturned collapsible for a couple of hours. Whoa. Light Ola realises he's going to need to take charge of this upside-down collapsible boat because waves are being generated on a sea that has up until this point been calm and clear and any one of those waves will be enough to sink this boat. It's being held up by a bubble of air that is held beneath the wooden structure of the collapsible boat. Every time the ship just slightly goes out of the water too much, air leaves the underside of this collapsible boat. And so over the hours that they're out in the water, they are getting lower and lower and lower into the sea. And the wind is picking up. People are already wet. People are just dropping dead and falling off this boat. There are people clinging to it, including the ship's baker, Charles Hogan, who is just happily splashing in the water, holding on to the side of this collapsible boat. Is that the guy who was absolutely drunk and didn't even really realise anything was going wrong? Yeah, he's just got, he didn't even get his hair wet, that guy. <laughs> but there are people just literally dropping dead. So Light Ola takes command. He stands up, orders everybody who can to stand up on the keel of this ship. That's the long spine that runs along the base of the boat. And he will order them, lean to your left, lean to your right, or stand still, basically to keep them moving with the sea. And eventually, one of the Titanic's other officers, Officer Lowe, who is the guy that goes back to find survivors, he's the only lifeboat that goes back after the Titanic sinks, he spots them. And to him, it looks like about 30 people standing on the water because the lifeboat has gotten so low by the point that he spots them that they're barely standing above the sea. And he powers out to them in his lifeboat and rescues all of them. And they all eventually get on board the Carpathia at about 8 a.m. So this guy, Light Ola, has after condemning a lot of men, dozens of men perhaps to death by not putting any of them in the lifeboats, has now corralled this bunch of survivors on top of a upside down collapsible boat for hours who were presumably minutes away from certain death and some of them actually get off all thanks to him and his command. Yeah, I mean, there's really no doubt about it. The 30-odd people who are pulled off that overturned lifeboat owe their survival to 
his command. Wow. It's a quite an extraordinary story, you know, and this kind of really plays into the man that Charles Light Oller was. There was just constantly this refrain of duty being thrust upon Light Oller, and he just happens to always rise to the moment. You know, that's very much who he is. Okay, great. I feel like I've got a good understanding of that. So now can we finally talk about this book that he wrote that was banned in its original publication run? Well, Tim, before we talk about the book, there's a question we need to answer, and that is, what if Light Ola knew about the iceberg and did nothing to prevent disaster? But that is a question for the next episode. Oh, come on! Thanks for listening. You can follow and listen to both seasons of Did Titanic Sync on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any other podcast app so you don't miss an episode. This podcast was written by Carlo Ritchie, directed by Abby Howes, and produced and edited by me, Tim Batt. The executive producer for the series is Justin Gregory. Tim Watkin is executive editor for audio at RNZ. Kakite.